Well, good morning. And it is important for preachers to know that they have um, done okay. I don't know that any preacher, when they get done, ever thinks, boy, that was a great sermon. I knocked that out of the park. Almost always on Monday, it's, eh, I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have done this. I don't want those texts, by the way. <laughs> but it, like Mati said, it is really encouraging to me today, too, to see so many new faces now, that's either really good news or it's not very good news. It's not very good news if I'm so old that I can't even remember the faces I see from one week to the next. <laughs> then that's not so good. I don't think that's the case here. It's good to see so many of you here. Good to be here worshiping with you today. Today, we are going to be looking at this passage. This is just the first part of it, Luke 13, 1 through 21. We're going to go through all 21 verses. It doesn't seem, when you read the whole thing, as if they all go together, especially the last couple little, tiny little parables, but they really do. And I want to get into that today. Here's what we have visitors from California today. The title of my message today is, You Can't Get to Fresno That Way. Now, you're not going to find that in the Bible. You'll see why it gets there at the end of the sermon. But let me say this. I have a terrible sense of direction. I have never understood those jokes about guys who won't stop to ask for directions. I always stop for directions, and it never does me any good. I knew that this was the case way back when I was a freshman in college. I went to the University of Wisconsin at Eau Claire, which if you, were, if you looked at a map and you look at Minneapolis and you go 90 miles straight east, that's where Eau Claire is. And when I uh, registered, apparently I registered late because I didn't get into the dorms right away. They were too full. And so for the first two weeks, I had to commute from the home of my assistant pastors. Uh, his mother lived in a little town called Osseo, which was 20 mile, 21 miles south of Eau Claire. And so for two weeks, I just traveled back and forth. There's 21 miles. The last day that I was there, I apparently wasn't paying attention, and I'm driving along and 20 minutes goes by, and I don't pay any attention. And it gets about a half an hour, and I'm, I start looking around. I go, this doesn't look right. But I still don't know I'm going the wrong way. And then I see a sign that says Black River Falls, two miles. Black River Falls is almost 60 miles away from Eau Claire. <laughs> I'd been traveling that far and had no clue. It continues. Later on when I went to seminary, I was in Minneapolis. I was at a place called Bethel. And I used to get so frustrated when I had to go someplace because it seemed like I was always making the wrong choice. So I thought, being a logical kind of person, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a test. I'm going to keep a log. I'm going to keep it in the glove compartment. And every time that, for the next month, every time that I have a choice between one of two ways, not five ways because that's too many variables, I'm going to write down, did I choose right or wrong? And I'll bet you it's going to be about 50%. So I do it the whole month, tally it up at the end of the month, and you know how often I was wrong? 92% of the time. <laughs> Every time, absolutely convinced I was going the right way. I get ready to turn it. It's got to be this way. It can't be that way. So you go, that, and wrong. I have a terrible sense of direction. It continues to this day. What it reminds me is this. Just because you're moving fast in a certain direction does not mean you're making progress. It all depends on the destination that you want to reach. Now, what is true in driving is equally true, but far more important in the spiritual life in regard to your spiritual and eternal destination. That is what we're going to be talking about today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are a great God that you know exactly where you want us to go and that you have given us exactly the right tools to get there. And so, Father, I pray that as we look into this text today, these words from Jesus, that you might speak clearly to us and to me to get us to the right destination. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start out. We'll break it apart in little sections. One through three, first of all. Luke 13 verses 1 through 3. Here's what it says. There were some present at that very time who told Jesus about the Galileans 
whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he, that is Jesus, answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, first, a little bit of history before we get to these words themselves, and that is that, first of all, Jesus apparently was not in Jerusalem when this happened. Apparently, some Galileans who were from the north came down, were giving their sacrifices, making at the temple, and something happened, and Pilate, the Roman governor, killed them. That's what it means when it says he mixed their blood with their sacrifices. Jesus wasn't there at that time, apparently. Second thing, they make it a special note that these are not just worshipers, these are Galileans. There could be a couple reasons for that. Number one, if they know Jesus, they knew that he grew up in Nazareth, which is where? Galilee. It's like, hey, did you hear what they did to your countrymen? It could also be that the Galileans, apparently, according to some historical documents anyway, were prone to revolt, which may be why Pilate did what he did to them. Residents of Judea, where he may be at this time, he's not in Jerusalem, he's on his way there, also looked down on Galileans, and they especially looked down on their accents. You may remember at the very end of the gospel, they know that Peter was with Jesus because they said, we can tell from your accent, you Galilean. That's probably going on here. But the main thing that is going on here, they're bringing up an old theological debate, and they want Jesus to take sides. There were certain rabbis that said, if something bad happens to you, it means you deserved it. God is just getting you for what you did. You see it all the way back in the book of Job with his friends. If all these nasty things happen to you, it must be something you did. They want Jesus to take sides in that theological argument. That's that part of it. I also want to tell you just a little bit about Pilate. Most of you know who he was, Pontius Pilate. He was the prefect of Judea from 26 A.D. to 36 A.D. He got the job, like often happened in Roman politics, through a powerful friend of his back in Rome, whose name was Sejanus. Sejanus was the uh, proconsul or the prefect of the Praetorian Guard who protected the Roman emperor. But Sejanus had a real taste for power, and at some point, the emperor Tiberius found out about what looked like a plot against him led by Sejanus, and he had him killed. He was killed in 31. So if you do the math, Pilate gets the job through Sejanus in 26. Sejanus is killed in 31. Pilate is, keeps his position for another few years, and then he's done. That often happened in Rome. If you lose your protector, you're gone. Pilate had a reputation for violence, for being irritable, for not listening. So there are several. This particular incident that is talked about here is not in history, but they're very similar ones. For example, at one point, the soldiers of Rome were basically situated in Caesarea on the coast, but he decided to take them with their banners. And if you know about Roman banners, they had symbols of the Roman emperor as God. He took them from Caesarea and brought them into Jerusalem. And there was such an outcry that eventually he threatened to kill the Jews. They bared their necks, and he decided not to do it because he didn't want to get in trouble with Rome. That's the character of Pilate. He minted coins with Roman images on them and gave them to the people of Judea. What do you think they're going to do with those? He didn't care. Late in his rule, there was an incident in Samaria where he got angry with them. He slaughtered a bunch of them. And some of them who were left complained to the governor of Syria, who complained to Rome. That's when he got called back. On his way back, Tiberius, who was the emperor when he was named, uh, uh, I keep forgetting the word, prefect, died. And the next guy did not like Pilate, and he disappears from history. Nobody knows exactly what happened to him. That's all background. Now let's go back to the text. This was a perfect time when these people tell Jesus about the Galileans who Pilate killed in the temple when they're making sacrifices. It was a perfect time for him to make a political statement, if that's what he wanted to do. And it could be about those awful Romans. Yes, they're awful. We should overthrow them. You're right. I can't stand it that they killed my brethren. Let's overthrow them. He could have could have made a theological statement. Yes, you're right. If this happened to those guys, they were the worst Galileans in Galilee. 
could have said that, but he didn't. Instead, he does what he always does, and he does it with us too. He makes it deeply personal. He says, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you, plural, repent, you, plural, will all likewise perish. Now, we, all of us, have a natural tendency to want to talk about how bad other people are, especially the ones we don't like. I do it. I try to modify it. I try to get better, but it's a natural tendency. You know, our terrible political leaders, did you hear what they did today? Ah! Or those murderous soldiers, like in this day. Or those evil Galileans, like in this day. Or you fill in the blank. They're bad. They're guilty. They're horrible. They fully deserve whatever they get. They are worse sinners than us, and therefore they should suffer horribly, just like the Galileans. How long does Jesus spend on that? Not one nanosecond. <laughs> Instead, he uses the tragedy to focus our attention on us. Unless you repent, you likewise will perish. Now, there's two key words here, and I want to spend a little more time than normal on these two key because they're so important to this whole passage. The first one is repent. The word metanoia in Greek, where it comes from, means to think differently afterwards. Somebody says something and you think differently afterwards. It talks about a change of mind, a change of your purpose, a change of your direction, like in my story at the beginning. Sometimes I think, in this day and age in particular, we talk so much about God's grace and unconditional love that we forget all about repentance. But God demands repentance wherever sin shows up. And that never changes. When we're going the wrong way, I think I'm going to Eau Claire, but instead I'm going to Black River Falls, the only thing to do is to turn around and go the other way. Now that may sound to us like a very Old Testament thing, but did you know that the word repentance is used more than twice as often in the New Testament than in the Old Testament? And the Old Testament is three times longer than the New Testament. In Luke especially, Jesus frequently talks about repentance. In chapter 5, verse 32, he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Chapter 10, verses 13 and 14, he's talking to two cities. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Chapter 11, verse 32, he says, The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. And that something greater than Jonah was he himself. Now, all of those verses lead up to Luke 13, where we are this morning. But there are several more that even follow. Chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus says, I tell you there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who does what? Repents. Then over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Chapter 15, verse 10, I tell you there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Chapter 17, verses 3 and 4, pay attention to yourselves, he says. If your brother sins, does anybody ever sin against you? If you're shaking your head, no, you're a liar. You need to <laughs> repent right now. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he what? Repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. And the last one is after his resurrection. Here's what he says. Thus it is written, chapter 24, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that what? Repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in His name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? But someone might ask, and it's a legitimate question, 
Does the requirement of repentance stop with the Gospels? After all, the Gospels describe a kind of transitional period between the Old Testament of law and the New Testament about the covenant of grace. The arrival of Jesus inaugurated the kingdom. The kingdom began with the coming of the king, who's Jesus. But that kingdom hasn't yet come in all its fullness. So, was repentance just for that transitional time? The apostles apparently didn't think so. Peter ended his very first sermon at Pentecost in Acts 2 like this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2. Now, in his second sermon, which is Acts 3, he says this, Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Do you want times of refreshing in your life? It starts with repentance and faith. Many decades later, after those two sermons, After a lifetime of faithful ministry, the Apostle John wrote almost essentially the same thing. 1 John 1, 9. It's a famous verse to many of you. If we confess our sins, he wrote, he, that is God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now by confess, John clearly means we are to admit our sins, name them, Repent of them and go in a new direction empowered by the gracious Spirit of Jesus. This is what it means to walk with God. We have a problem, though. Have you noticed that repentance of sin and divine judgment on unrepentant sin gets very little airtime in our culture? A movement is growing, even in supposedly evangelical churches, to downplay, to ignore, or even deny the appalling seriousness of sin, the wrath of God against sin, and the certainty of divine punishment for unforgiven sin. Jesus took a very different approach. Unless you repent, He said to them and to us, you will all likewise perish. So what does it mean to perish? That's the second word. It comes from a Greek word that means to destroy utterly, to suffer certain death. Now the Galileans whom Pilate killed did not die horribly because they were worse sinners than others. Jesus doesn't even explain why they died. He does not give a reason for their deaths other than to say that it was not because they had committed especially heinous sins. But he does say, and many today would call this politically incorrect at best and insensitive and callous at worst, that unless you and I repent, we will all likewise perish just as surely as those Galileans did. Now, we probably won't die in some kind of religious massacre, and certainly not at the hands of a Roman tyrant. But here is Jesus' point, and hear this carefully. Unforgiven sin always results in certain death and utter destruction, no matter who you are. This is why the Apostle Paul, in that great theological book of Romans, says uncomfortable things like this. In chapter 1, verses 29 and 31, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice sin. And he names several of them. Things like greed and malice and envy and strife and deceit and gossip. Gossip? Gossip. And insolence and faithlessness and disobedience. It's also why he writes in chapter 2, Because of your hard and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Skip ahead a few verses. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. Paul calls it, quote unquote, the righteous judgment of God, that one day the Lord will, quote, in flaming fire, inflect vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. 
That's 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 9. Now, I don't think this is the place for us to go into a long discussion of the final judgment and of hell. It's enough for us to realize today that whatever eternal judgment looks like, it will be at least as bad as any of the most terrifying biblical descriptions of it. Jesus means it when He says to us, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Again, most unrepentant sinners don't die at the hands of cruel men like Pilate. But Scripture reminds us, 1 Timothy 5.24, the sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment but the sins of others appear later. In all cases, however, every sin ever committed receives God's judgment. For those who place their faith in Jesus, the full punishment for all their sins already has fallen on Jesus Christ as He hung on the cross. For those who do not repent, for those who think their sins aren't so bad that they need a Savior, God's full punishment Holy wrath will fall on them and their sin, and they will perish. Verses 4 and 5, Jesus continues. He says, Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Tower of Siloam doesn't exist today. It fell before this time. Whether they rebuilt it or not, if it was rebuilt, the Romans destroyed it when they destroyed Jerusalem. It's not there. Most um, biblical archaeologists think that it was probably near the Pool of Siloam, which is on the uh, south side of Jerusalem, of the lower city. What's interesting to note about this is that it's almost as if Jesus set out to be intentionally upsetting to His crowd. If He was insensitive... And politically incorrect in his response to the question about the murdered Galileans, now he brings up a tragedy that nobody even asked him about. The first question concerns some butchery by evil men, and now he talks about a tragedy caused by nature, what many people today would call an act of God. The first episode involved Galileans, those guys from the north, this one, residents of Jerusalem, Judeans. The good guys. Jesus asks the crowd who's listening to him if those 18 Jerusalem residents who died in the tower's collapse were, quote, worse offenders than everyone else living in the city. Now, we don't know if anybody tried to answer him. Probably not. But immediately, he answers it himself. He says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Exactly the same words as before. Although this time, the catastrophe involved a natural disaster and nothing caused by wicked humans. In just the last few months, my wife and I, Lisa, have heard several reports from friends and in our own lives of people dying unexpectedly and too soon. One of them died in a car crash coming home with his family from Bend. Two of them died of cancer, different kinds of cancer. Another died of a drug overdose. Another one died in an avalanche during a ski trip. Another died of a rare, rapid autoimmune illness. Some of these people were Christians, and some of them were not. But all of those deaths remind me that we live in a fallen world. None of us is guaranteed tomorrow although we often act as though we'll live forever. Jesus reminds us in this text that the right time for repentance and faith is always now, since none of us knows how many more breaths we have to take. Paul expressed the same kind of urgency in 2 Corinthians 6 too. He said, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the time of salvation. Are you ready to meet Him when that day comes? Now, I hope and pray that none of you, none of us, dies in a natural disaster or some human-caused tragedy. But just imagine, for a moment, 
that you had some kind of a time machine that would show you exactly when you were going to die, how you were going to die, when, and it was unavoidable. You couldn't say, oh, because I know now, now I won't go to Salem since that's where I was going to die. It wouldn't work that way. You knew exactly the time and manner of your death. Let's further say that you found out that after you look at it, when you get home from church today, you had six days left. You know that next week at this time, you would not be here at Boone's Ferry Church or anywhere else on earth. How would you spend those last six days? Are you right with God? Would you be ready and confident to stand before Him before the week is out? What areas of your life and my life call for repentance, not necessarily for salvation, but for getting back on the right track? Verses 6 through 9, he's going to start talking about this. He says, and he told a parable. That and connects what he just said with this. So he's on the same theme. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. He's connecting this parable with what he just said, with repentance and making a decisive turn to go in the right direction. The basic point of the story is pretty simple. Fruit trees are supposed to do what? Produce fruit, right? Or they get removed. And the subject of the parable is equally clear, maybe not to us, but it was to them, because throughout the Old Testament, Israel is pictured over and over as both a vineyard and as a fig tree. They know exactly what he's talking about, especially because they remember that he was just talking about Israelites up here in the previous passage. God is the one who planted the fig tree Israel, Jesus had come to earth as the prophesied king of Israel, and now he has ministered to the nation at this point for almost three years. And yet, the tree has borne very little fruit. Although the people of Israel had seen Jesus perform all the signs that were prophesied of the Messiah, they had not welcomed him as king or repented of their sin, especially its leaders. The time for judgment, Jesus is saying, has nearly come. In His mercy, the Lord will give even more time to the nation, even more miracles, even more signs, even more divine teaching. But if it would not repent, judgment would inevitably come. And we know from history that it did in 70 AD. But He doesn't spend any more time on that. He's going to move on. And so will we. Verses 10 through 13. Luke explains, now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, probably not at the same time, but he's connecting it again. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and she glorified God. This is a really bright spot in the middle of some teaching that can feel fairly dark. Jesus, as the king of the coming kingdom, displayed all the signs of the prophesied Messiah. He had mercy on the suffering and he bestowed grace on the unworthy. Here, he heals a Jewish woman, we know that because he calls her a daughter of Abraham a little bit later, who had suffered terribly for 18 long, excruciating years. Just in the last few weeks, I've had some twinges going on in my back. It helps when I bend over like this. And actually, when I was working on this talk, I thought, I'm kind of like that woman, <laughs> except I can straighten up. She couldn't. For 18 years, she was like this. We don't know exactly what it was. It could have been a demonic thing. It could have been a physical thing. We're not really told. That's not the point. The point is, for 18 years, she had been suffering like this. Jesus saw her in a congregation like this, told her to come forward, placed his hands on her, and she was healed instantly. 
With that touch came God's healing power, just as it had been prophesied. She understood what had happened, and she immediately glorified God for what it had been done. That's a good place to do that in the synagogue, isn't it? In the, amongst the people of God, to praise Him for what He's done. But not everybody there saw the healing as a good thing or as a divine mercy. Look at verse 14. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant, not happy, indignant, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Now We need to remember, but by the time of Jesus, formal religion in Israel had largely degenerated into empty ritual, formulaic praying, and man-made rules. The religious elite used Scripture like a club if it suited their purposes and elevated their position. Earlier, Jesus had said to them in Mark 7, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, the people, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now in this case, the synagogue leader felt incensed because Jesus broke one of the, his clique's man-made rules. Rules that kept him and his ilk completely in charge. And he rebuked the, human woman, the, the healed woman rather than celebrating the staggering, merciful thing that God had just done. That's amazing to me in some ways. It would be like somebody handing you a check for a million dollars, but you refuse it. Do you know why? Because you find out that somebody signed it with their left hand and you're right-handed. Does that make sense? Or it would be something like um, refusing, a, you're a big sports fan, refusing a once-in-a-lifetime championship of your team that won because a player you didn't like scored the winning basket. That's what this is. He's indignant because Jesus broke their rules, not Scripture. This guy called for the woman to repent and change when in fact it was his heart that needed a change and repentance. When we get up here and teach, it's not that we have it all together and you poor sluggards don't. Jesus is always talking to all of us at the same time. So look at verses 15 and 17 through 17. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And the answer was, yeah, they did. And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at the glorious things that were done by him. Now, Jesus had been watering and fertilizing the vineyard and fig tree of Israel for nearly three years when this incident happened. And still, he saw no fruit from Israel's religious leaders. So he responds with a rebuke of his own, calling not just the synagogue ruler, but also his colleagues, hypocrites. Two-faced men who pretended to be one thing, but really were something quite different. God created the Sabbath day to bless humankind, not to keep men and women in bondage. Of all days on the calendar, His glorious power to be shown over the devil should be exhibited on the Sabbath. Not only had the synagogue rulers and his ilk not repented, but they had taken a good gift of God and made it into a prison. And notice that while the chastised ruler did not respond to Jesus, all the people who witnessed the miracle and heard Jesus' defense of it rejoiced at all the glorious things, plural, that he had done. Verses 18 and 19. Jesus said, therefore. Now, we don't know if he's still in the synagogue, but that therefore connects it. These last two don't sound at first like they're connected, but they are. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? 
It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. He means, Luke means, that Jesus continues to focus on the same theme, that is the coming of the king and his kingdom, and that that kingdom requires a change in direction among his subjects. They've wandered away, and so they need to repent, change their minds and behavior, and start moving in the same direction that God himself is moving. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a mustard seed. How many of you have ever seen a mustard seed from the Holy Land? They're tiny. They're bigger than a grain of salt, but they're not as big as a BB. I mean, they're small. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, he inaugurated at that time the kingdom age, even though it would not come to full size until much later, until at his return. This little parable highlights the power of the kingdom, including repentance, which is how you get into it. Even at the beginning, when it's very small, a full-grown mustard plant, if you've ever seen it in the Holy Land, does look like a tree, and birds do nest in it. Jesus' kingdom is like that, small right now, but powerful. Hadn't they just witnessed it in the healing of this woman who'd been sick for 18 years? His kingdom had not by this time grown to its full size, but it most certainly would. In fact, one day it will cover the whole earth, as both Isaiah and Habakkuk both predicted. Quote, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I long for that day to see it, to experience it. But how does a man or a woman enter that kingdom? Jesus himself told us, Again, in Luke 24, after his resurrection, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Verses 20 and 21, and we're done. And again he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Now, while this is a different picture, it's exactly the same message and point. Leaven, or yeast, has great power even when it's small and before it accomplishes its final work. Eventually, it works its way all the way through the dough, penetrating every part of it. And what does it do? It makes it so that it can be life-giving and delicious and wonderful. Jesus' kingdom is just like that. It began in power the moment Jesus started his earthly ministry, teaching, healing, casting out demons, giving sight to the blind, healing the lame, all of that. But it will not work its way all the way through the dough of this world until his return. In those days, he will bring it to maturity and it will be amazing. It will be of the same character as Jesus' earthly ministry, but far bigger and complete. No one, though, gets into that kingdom except through the narrow gate that Jesus himself provides, and we'll hear about that next week. Those who try to enter by any other way will hear from Jesus himself, quote, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. Have you repented of your sin and placed your faith in Jesus? If so, you will be among those, as Luke 13, 29 says, who come from east and west and from north and south and who recline at table in the kingdom of God. Here's the bottom line. If you want to move forward into all that God has for you, you have to make sure that you're heading in the right direction. C.S. Lewis wrote this in Mere Christianity. We all want progress, but progress means getting nearer to the place you want to be. And if you've taken a wrong turn, then to go forward does not get you any nearer. 
If you are on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. And in that case, the man who turns back soonest is the most progressive man. He says, there is nothing progressive about being pig-headed and refusing to admit a mistake. And I think if you look at the present state of the world, it's pretty plain that humanity has been making some big mistakes. Now, he wrote that back in the 40s. Do you think that's still true today? We are on the wrong road, and if that is so, we must go back. Going back is the quickest way forward. Now, I began today by talking about my horrible sense of direction. I want to end with another story in the same vein. When I worked as an editor for Multnomah Press, I was visiting an author, author in Danville, California, close to San Francisco. When I got done with him, I needed to go to Fresno and meet with some other people. That's about two hours and 20 minutes. Do you know how long it took me? Over five hours. Do you know why? Because I kept going the wrong direction. <laughs> that was in the days before GPS. I had a map. I was going north when I should have gone south. I was going west when I should have gone east. It took me over five hours to get there. And I'll never forget, I now finally arrive at, fortunately I didn't have any appointments that day or the next day, but I'm frustrated and I'm angry and I'm in this car and I pull up to the stoplight on the outskirts of Fresno and there's this group of young kids in a convertible that pull up alongside of me and they're having a good time and they want me to roll down my window. I roll down my window and they say, hey man, can you tell us to, how to get to pennies or something? And I remember grinding my teeth and saying, gentlemen, I just had a hard time finding Fresno. <laughs> and they went, oh man, you're more lost than we are. And they took off. <laughs> and I was. Here's the thing. The only way for me to get to Fresno was to turn around from the way I was going and go the right way. In exactly the same way, the only way any of us will ever get to the great feast in the kingdom of God is by repenting of our sin and accepting Jesus' work of forgiveness on the cross. Again, have you done that? Are you ready for the great feast in the kingdom of God that you only can get to by turning around if you're going the wrong way and going the right way? If you don't know or if you aren't sure, I urge you to talk to Matisse, to Vern, to some of the people who have been here for a while and find out what it takes to be on the right road. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this text. I thank you, Lord, that every text is not sweetness and light, but some of them get to the heart of where we live even if it makes us uncomfortable. I thank you for that. Because it's no good wandering out in the Pacific coast when you want to get to Fresno. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here today that has not yet come to faith, that you might show them the way. I pray that if there are those here today who are on the road but have drifted away from it, I pray that you would show them and bring them back to the good way. I thank you for these things, and I pray in Jesus' name. We're about to take of the, partake of the Lord's Supper. Um, today we're going to be doing it together. So in this next song, I urge you to get up and take some of the elements and then wait as we all partake together. Thanks.